Okay, so good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to uh, an IMEC -E webinar. I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes just to, to allow people to, to log in, because people are still logging in. And we'll start in about a minute's time at 11.33. Okay, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's time now is 11.33, so I, I propose to get underway. Uh, so welcome to this uh, Bedfordshire IMECI uh, event. Um, it's entitled The Importance of Grammar and Punctuation for Engineers. Now, before I uh, go any further, um, there's a bit of housekeeping. Uh, because we've got quite a lot of people, um, all of you have been muted. And so what I propose you do uh, as we go uh, through this event, uh, on a piece of paper and a pen, if you can write down any questions as you go along. And what I, just in case um, one of the presenters actually answers your question, uh, rather than answer it, asking it straight away, um, if you just wait until the end before asking. And you'll find at the right hand corner of your screen a chat function. If you select that, and you can do that now, um, you'll find a Q&A tab, um, and that's questions and answers. And what I propose at the end of the uh, session, we'll come to a Q&A section, and if you type in your question there. And what I'll do is I'll read them out, and we will endeavour to answer them as best as we can. Okay, so what's the relevance of the photograph on the start slide? Um, so that, a few years ago, I ended up in a Papua New Guinea uh, uh, village in a very remote uh, rainforest village that uh, I had to fly into a mud strip and, and then take a boat across to, to get there. And you can see in the background, there's a, a palm leaf hut. Now, that's the, the local buildings are made of there. Um, so just the two of us were in this village uh, for, for a few uh, days, um, and we visited the school there. And um, while visiting the school, I took school supplies, and rubber pencils, um, mats, et cetera. Now, while I was walking around the school, um, I noticed um, something written on the wall. If you can, next slide, please. So on the wall was written, I'm hungry, let's eat, Grandma. And underneath was written, I'm hungry, let's eat, Grandma. Now, that little comma makes a, a, a lot of difference. What makes this even more amusing is less than, well, just over 25 years ago was the last case of cannibalism in Papua New Guinea. So in this case, punctuation can really save lives. So with grammar, um, so grammar and punctuation are important in a remote jungle village. Um, wh why not for us? Why not for you? Um, so I see often the misuse of grammar and spelling myself. I'm guilty of it too. And um, so I thought we'll put this event together and hence why we have this today. Um, so we're very lucky today to have uh, Dr. Alison Chand, um, who's going to steer us through um, the pitfalls of the English language. Now, a little bit about Alison. So uh, Dr. Alison Chand is a self-confessed grammar nerd and has worked as a freelance proofreader and copy editor since 2012, uh, specialising in editing academic materials in a range of disciplines. She's also a lecturer at the Scottish Oral History Centre at Strathclyde University in Scotland and at the University of the Highlands and Islands, and was working as a freelance oral uh, historian in various interviewing, transcribing, and advising capabilities. So we're in good hands, ladies and gentlemen. So without further ado, I, I will hand over to Alison, uh, Dr. Alison Chant, who will steer us, hopefully, through the traps, mishaps uh, we have with the English language. Over to you, Alison. Well, um, thank you, thank you very much for that, Philip. Um, I'll just click on. There we go. Um, to my start slide. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for that introduction, um, and thank you to everybody for coming. Um, I will do my very best to make the next forty minutes um, a bit more interesting than a webinar on grammar and punctuation and uh, why they're important than that sounds. Um, uh, as um, as Philip said, um, I'm a bit of a grammar nerd. Um, I always 
happy and I've always quite liked words um, and, and how they work and um, that's why I've kind of fallen into the, the line of the, the different lines of work um, that, that I've been in um, particularly over the last sort of eight, eight to ten years when I've, I've been working as a as a freelance proofreader and copy editor. Um, so, I, so I obviously undertake um, a lot of editing and proofreading work um, in my daily life um, but also through my academic work I spend a lot of time writing um, and marking um, as well and I, I see quite a lot of different kinds of writing and uh, quite a lot of different kinds of mistakes um, as well therefore so I'm going to try and uh, draw on some of some of that and some of those um, in in talking um, today um, so over the next um, 40 minutes or so um, I'm going to try and have a look at why grammar and punctuation are important um, and what difference it can make um, in presenting written material um, if you get them right um, and what difference it can make um, if you if you get them wrong. Um, in doing that, I'd like to try and cover some basic rules about sentences, punctuation, quotation marks, words that are often confused with each other and, uh, and yeah, give, give an idea of why it makes a difference um, for, for those to be right. This has to be, by its nature, a bit of a dip into to some of those those areas, um, and within 40 minutes, it's impossible to cover everything there is to know about grammar. So I'll take quite a broad brush approach to it, but I will try and leave plenty of time um, at the end for questions and any questions you have that you, you'd like to ask. And uh, as Philip said, if you want to take a note of those um, as you go through um, to, to ask um, at the end, and um, if there's any, if there are any areas that you would like to, me to talk about in a wee bit more detail, I'd be happy to, to try um, and do that. Um, I think something to say um, before starting out is, is that a lot of what I'm going to present won't necessarily always be um, a black and white case of this is right um, and this is wrong, um, grammar and the English language and spelling. It's uh, an evolving concept in how we use language and how we use grammar um, changes and, and is changing um, o over time. Um, some things that, that 10 years ago might have been regarded as, as completely incorrect, now things that we would use, um, if, if not commonly, then they might be becoming more acceptable. Um, an example of that is something like the split infinitive. So, um, it used to be incorrect to say something like a kind of Star Trek line to boldly go um, where where we had, I can't I'm not a Star Trek fan, <laughs> I know it starts with to boldly go, that would have been regarded as wrong to have boldly in there, but now it's quite commonly done um, and it's almost become a rule in itself that, that it's fine um, to do. Um, another, maybe a more recent example of that is um, the use of um, so the gender neutral pronoun they and people choosing to refer to themselves as they rather than he or she or him or her. So um, it might sound completely incorrect to say they is going out of the door um, and a lot of style guides would still have that as completely incorrect. But in, in the case of using that as a singular gender neutral pronoun, that is now regarded as correct in some cases. So, so uh, this isn't a sort of black and white case of things must always be be wrong if they're written in some ways, but um, what grammar and punctuation do do is, is change meaning um, subtly sometimes, and hopefully I can try and make you um, aware um, of that as, as well as um, things things to avoid. Um, just a couple of examples, um, first of all, of um, thing, things where I have um, seen problems and, and errors. Um, this is um, actually another um, part of my working life, which is quite different to any of the things um, Philip mentioned, is that I teach, or I, or I did in pre-COVID times, teach one evening a week as a children's swimming teacher. Um, and this is a page that comes out of the Swimming Teaching Association Lifeguard um, Manual. Um, when I saw this, admittedly this might be a grammar nerd thing to, to, to notice, but one of the things that I noticed about this, this page, and, and these kind of errors came up all the way through. This quite professional document um, was the incorrect use of the apostrophe. You see it after elderly pool users, um, and, and again after pool users three, four times in that in that bullet list. Um, 
hopefully this will be clearer um, towards um, the end of this session when I'll, I will talk about apostrophe use and how it's used. But what that apostrophe indicates there is, is the possessive. So um, the way that's written suggests that it should be talking about elderly pool users changing rooms or something like that. Um, but they're not. They're talking about elderly pool users or young pool users. Um, as a standalone concept, um, so, so it's incorrect to use that. Not only has it been done incorrectly, but it's been done um, inconsistently. So you'll see um, in the bullet point that says elderly pool users or very young pool users, one has an apostrophe and one doesn't. Um, and there's, there's no reason um, for that to be the case. Um, I think most people probably don't spend as much time um, on this page as me, but there, I think there are enough errors there that somebody reading that w would notice or somebody with a knowledge of, of language would notice. And I think that detracts a bit from the professionalism um, of, of the organisation. Um, I did write to them after I did my lifeguard qualification, but they, they, didn't, they didn't get back to me. Um, but I did notice that their updated version is a bit better, so, so maybe they, they took on somebody else. Uh, this one here, um, it's actually a photoshopped one. It didn't make it as far as a, as a bus stop, fortunately. Um, but uh, this is actually more of a proofreading situation than a grammar error situation. Um, and um, one that you see quite a lot, actually, um, the word public um, is found in a lot of documents and signage. Um, and um, this particular error that you, you see on this sign is not picked up in a spell check because it, it is a word. Um, and it's also a word that looks quite similar to public. Um, so it's one that I've seen in quite a bit of proofreading that, that I've done. Um, and what I will talk about at the, the end of today's session are some tips for proofreading, because I think um, it's useful to point out that no matter how well you know your grammar and how well you know your spelling, um, it, it, you can still miss things when you're checking for it, particularly if it's something you've written yourself and you've read um, an awful lot of times um, before. So I will talk at the end of of the session today about um, ways to stop errors like this um, slipping, slipping through the net. So I think it's, it's useful to start, start off with, with the sentence um, and, and, and what it, um, what it is, um, as that's the basis of what we're using punctuation and grammar um, in. Um, and a, a sentence um, defining it quite simply would be a set of words that's complete um, in itself. And Sarah eats chocolate here is an example of a simple um, sentence. Um, it has a subject of the sentence, Sarah. It has a verb, a doing word to eat. She's eating the chocolate. Um, and you have um, chocolate, you have the object of the sentence and the thing that she is doing something to um, or using um, within that sentence. With a simple sentence, though, we can't say anything particularly interesting. Um, and in practice, most sentences are more complex um, than that. And we, we make them more complex by adding bits um, along the way, um, often known as, as clauses or parts, parts of a sentence. Um, and it's important to think about um, whether the bits of a sentence can stand alone um, in whether we join them into a sentence or whether we split them into separate sentences was, was something that I quite often see um, is something that, that would be better as one sentence divided into two sentences or something that is really two sentences um, joined up by punctuation that, that shouldn't be there. So here we have um, a more complex sentence. My cousin Sarah, who lives next door, always eats the white chocolate first. And you'll see all of those components have to go together as part of a sentence. Um, who lives next door on its own isn't a set of words complete in itself. It doesn't go together. Always eats the white chocolate first, doesn't stand on its own. So combined together, they make a sentence, um, but uh, separately, they don't. Um, so so um, punctuation is needed um, to, divide, uh, to divide this sentence up. In this case, comets, which I'll talk about um, in, in just a moment and, and how those are used. Something that I would advise you um, to do and something that I've uh, kind of trained myself to do, um, I think over time, it was actually something suggested to me by an English teacher at school, um, was that the, um, 
the technique of active reading um, and active writing. And by that, I mean when you're reading a piece of material, and sort of any piece of material, whether it's a newspaper or uh, an article online, um, a story, a novel, um, it, anything at all, if you're reading it, sort of be constantly thinking as you're reading it about, about the language and about um, if that piece of punctuation was used in a different place, what difference would that make? If that punctuation wasn't there, what difference would that make? If this word was used in this position instead of this position, what difference would that make? That sounds like quite a, a laborious way to read, and possibly it is at the start. Um, I think, but I actually found that it became second nature for me very quickly to try and think like that. Um, and it has been one of the best ways for, for me to help um, understand use of grammar and punctuation and why it needs to be um, where it is. Um, I'll probably bang on about that a bit more later on, but it's something that I find really helpful in trying to understand where you would place punctuation within a sentence. I think reading out loud is also something that's really helpful. So um, if you read that second sentence, my cousin Sarah, who lives next door, always eats the white chocolate first, you might not have many sort of pauses or anything in it. But if you read it out loud and use the punctuation in it, if you were to see that sentence and you said, my cousin Sarah, who lives next door, always eats the white chocolate first. So you're putting in pauses um, where those commas are. And um, what those commas are doing is adding an additional information to that sentence, which are not essential to the sense of the sentence. So my cousin Sarah always eats the white chocolate first. If you remove who lives next door, is a sentence. Um, on its own, but the commas there denote that additional information um, that's been added in, and reading it out loud makes that a bit clearer. So, how do we divide up? What are the different ways we can divide up parts of a sentence, um, and and why does it matter? Um, I've, I've heard. Well, I've heard the, the, the argument um, said that sort of punctuation is a bit outdated. Why, why do we use it um, anyway? Um, I think you can see um, on these signs here what's meant and what these signs intend to say. Um, and you can also see um, what, what they do say and the difference um, that the absence of punctuation makes. Um, sometimes the absence of punctuation can, can mean that you say something that, that looks a bit ridiculous doesn't mean at all what, what you meant to say. Um, so um, it's not always the case that if you if you don't know what you're doing with it, just just leave it out um, because you might end up with an outcome a bit like um, like, like you have um, in these signs, however unintended um, that may be. Um, so so commas and um, I'll start off with I'll start off with commas as I, I had them in, in the example in the complex. Um, sentence there. Um, again, as I said earlier, some some of this um, is not a case of it, it's right or wrong to use a comma in a particular place. It's quite often it's a style choice to, to use um, commas um, in a particular way. So, for example, one of the, the main uses um, of a comma is to, to separate um, two or more than two adjectives in a sentence, so a word that describes a noun. So here you have dog and crystal ball as your nouns. Um, and in the first example, in the first bullet point, small black dog has, has two adjectives, two words are used to describe um, that noun, dog. Um, and it would be correct to have a comma in that, in that um, phrase, in that question, small black dog. You can have a comma there saying small black dog. Um, those are two adjectives of equal weight used to describe um, a dog. It's also correct not to have a comma um, there. That's a style choice. Um, and for um, lots of organisations, publishing organisations in particular, will have style guides um, and style lists for, for work that they have. So they'll have um, uh, style preferences indicated on those lists for how grammar should be used, whether words should be hyphenated. If there's a choice between more than one spelling of a word, um, they would choose um, which which one and have it in the style guide. And it's actually something I see if I'm doing editing work for an organisation for the first time um, or for an individual, and if or if somebody is is doing um, 
work on, say, a novel or a book that's going to have a lot of different chapters. I would say develop a style guide. Sometimes I start it for them, um, but develop a, a style guide that has a list of your chosen spellings um, and then your output from your organisation will all be sort of consistently spelled and consistently hyphenated and consistently capitalised. So I think that's that's a good idea. Um, but a bit of a tangent from a bit of a tangent from commas. So in the first example you have the style choice about whether to use a comma, whether not to use a comma. In the second bullet point, small crystal ball, it's just being careful um, that the words there are actually adjectives. Crystal ball, because uh, if we talk about gazing into a crystal ball, it's quite a way, it's a widely understood noun um, by itself. Um, it's sort of separate from a ball. Um, so small crystal ball, I, I, you wouldn't usually use a comma um, there um, because I would say small is really the only adjective you would have there. So because you've got a word there that is attached to the ball and attached to the noun, you wouldn't you wouldn't need a comma. Um, you can also another use of of commas is to separate um, clauses or parts of the sentence, um, as um, as I said in that that example on, on the previous slide about um, Sarah eating chocolate and, and the the non essential information to the sentence being surrounded. Um, by commas, so that's another use um, of commas. Um, but do check um, when using it for, for using commas for that um, that you haven't adjusted what the sentence is saying. These examples here aren't saying exactly um, the same thing um, in the third and fourth bullet points um, on this slide. So. We have here, so it's not because we don't know who they're talking about. So in that in that first of that that third bullet point there on the, the slide, um, what that sentence is saying is well, whatever um, it is, um, it, it it's not because it's for some other reason. Um, it's it's for um, it's for something else. Um, in the second example, and again, reading out loud can help here. You're saying it's not because we don't know who they're talking about. So it, whatever it is, is not, um, and the reason for that is because we don't know who they're talking about. So um, where um, in the first example, because we don't know who they're talking about, is given as not the reason. In the second example, it is the reason. If that makes sense, and that that one comma has has made um, that difference um, in that that meaning. Um, in the the fifth and sixth, the bullet points about the gift vouchers, again, there's just a subtle difference um, in, in meaning there. So in the first of those gift voucher bullet points, gift vouchers in denominations of £10 and £50 are presented in a stylish folder. Um, and that suggests there that you have gift vouchers which are available in these two denominations, £10 and £50, they are presented in, the, in this folder. In the second example, we lose the commas and we have gift vouchers in denominations of £10 and £50 are presented in a stylish folder. And there's an implication um, there because those have not been presented as extra pieces of information to the sentence. The, comma, the commas are used there to present uh, extra pieces of information. So there, that are in the second example, there are no commas. So that is an integral part um, of the sentence. So that implies that there might be gift vouchers elsewhere of, of other denominations that aren't presented in a stylish folder. So not a major difference in meaning there, but just a, a very slight one because we've taken away that, that extra um, piece of information. Um, so all sorts of bits and pieces can, can occur in the middle of sentences. One thing to be aware of is when using a comma like that for additional information, they do need to come um, in pairs. So you need to have um, one on each side of that additional um, piece of information. So in denominations of £10 and £50, you have a comma outside that. And a good way to work out where those should go is to look at the sentence around that and think, does that work as a sentence on its own? So in the, the first of the gift voucher bullet points, if you take out the information with commas around it, um, the sentence says gift vouchers are presented in a stylish uh, folder. So that makes sense on its own as a set of words complete in itself. So your commas go around that non-essential information. Um, 
because the implication there is that these are the only denominations, so um, they, they don't need to be incorporated into the sentence, as in the second um, example. Um, at the bottom um, is actually the, the two bullet points involving however, and however is something that you see that, that, that I see quite often used um, in the middle of a sentence where it shouldn't necessarily be. Um, the first example of the first bullet point there, um, it is um, however is used correctly as an, a sort of additional piece of information, and we can use things like um, like however and and um, sort of joining words in there as your additional piece of, of information. So it says the solutions put forward so far, however, have proved too expensive. So that is one sentence. However, is additional to the sentence. It provides a bit of additional meaning. The solutions put forward so far have proved too expensive. Without the however, the however um, makes sense on its own as a sentence. So that's fine. In the second example, we have several solutions have been suggested. However, most are too expensive. I put a semicolon in there. Quite often, I would see that kind of thing with a with a comma um, in the second example. And the reason why you wouldn't in the second example, but you would in the first, is because um, the second example is actually two sentences um, joined together. You could also do that with a full stop after suggested, and have however. So. If you take out the however in that example, you have several solutions have been suggested, most are too expensive. That's two sentences run into one, so it doesn't make sense as a set of words complete um, in itself. So it needs a semicolon, which is a bit stronger than a comma there or a full stop. And I'll talk about semicolons um, in just in just a minute. Um, so that's just a few of the ways that, that you can use um, a comma. Uh, colons and semicolons add a bit of, sort of complexity um, to this um, and imply sort of different levels um, of, of connection um, between parts of sentences and, and also add sort of subtle adjustments in, in what sentences mean um, and what things mean. Um, so I'm going to talk a wee bit about the diff some of the differences here in what these sentences mean. Um, in the first example, Sue is coming to the party, colon, and he's going fishing. The presence of a colon there suggests that the two halves are connected very strongly. So Andy might only be going fishing because Sue has a party to go to. So there's a connection between those two things, and you can tell that because there's a colon um, there. Colons are often used as an introduction to, um, also often used as an introduction to a list or sort of after something like as follows, um, and there's also specialised uses for them, uh, like times, ratios, um, biblical references, subtitles. Um, you would use a colon to, to imply a relationship between a subtitle and then the starting off title, so it implies that really close um, relationship. Um, between the two things, um, the the semicolon um, is um, not quite as as strong as that, but still implies um, a level um, a level of connection there. So sort of somewhere in between having a full stop um, uh, or having a comma and having a colon, um, and uh, it, it's quite often used actually a semicolon where a colon would be better. I think with a semicolon. One of my main pieces of advice is to be very confident in why you're using it before you use it. Um, usually, you'd be better if you were going to plump for one of them to use as as a bit of a guess. I'd go with a colon rather than a semicolon because a, a semicolon is is um, it more often isn't right <laughs> than, than a colon, um, if, if that makes sense. So here we've got Alice is coming to the party, Mike's going fishing. So there might be a bit of a relationship between um, between those things. Um, maybe Alice and Mike are, are a couple, they need to know what each other are, are doing, but it's not completely dependent. Um, one, one action isn't completely dependent um, on on the other. In the final example, there, there isn't necessarily um, any connection implied at all between those. So we've got Mary's coming to the party, full stop, James is going fishing. So those could be two completely separate pieces of information with no connection um, between them um, at all. So the use of the colon and the semicolon in the above examples imply a relationship 
um, that, that isn't there um, in, in the bottom example. Um, so that's again some of the examples, although there are more specialised uses um, of, of some of these. What I'd say, if you're not confident with, with using colons and semicolons, it's often best not to use them and to keep sentences sort of shorter and punctuation simpler. Um, and I think it, it can look more professional to, to do that than to, to throw in semicolons where you're not quite sure sort of how, how, you're used, how, how they're used. Um, I think one way to become confident in using them is to sort of do that sort of active reading technique. And when you're reading material, you're reading reports, and you see them used, and you think, why is that used there? Um, what purpose does it have to, to use uh, a colon there? And in thinking that, you're sort of developing your awareness of, of what they're actually used for. So. Um, Coming into apostrophes, um, a couple of examples here of signs where these have gone wrong. And I think signs is actually somewhere that, that I notice apostrophes more than any other kind of of error. Um, I, I once, when I was at university, I lived next door to, it was an empty shop, and uh, the, uh, there were painters um, painting on a new sign to it one day, and I got up, and it was called Bedding Bits and Bobs, and they put... Um, an apostrophe uh, between the T and the S in bits, and an apostrophe between a B, the B and the S in, in bobs. And um, I remember walking down outside and sort of saying to them in a slightly naive <laughs> fashion that this wasn't right, and he said, I'm, ju I'm just painting it. Um, <laughs> so quite often, um, sort of unsolicited grammar advice isn't, isn't always welcome. Um, but here you've got a couple of other examples of signs where, where it hasn't um, worked out. In the first example, um, once I've talked about apostrophes, this will probably be clearer, but what they would like to say in haircuts and shaving is, is you are nuts not to come in. Um, and there needs to be an apostrophe there and an, and an E after the, the R to say that. What they, they have said is that your, as in the possessive, nuts are not to come in. Entirely different meaning. Um, signs also shouldn't have an apostrophe there. Hopefully, um, once I have explained why, that, that should be clearer. Um, so there are two sort of main reasons um, for apostrophes to, to be used. There, there are other, uh, other reasons as well, but two, two main ones. The first um, is um, as a contraction um, and uh, where to show where letters or parts of a word or parts of a second word have been omitted, um, as in these examples here. So it's a mouse a contracted version of it is a mouse. Um, it's been there for nearly a week. A contracted version of it has been there for nearly a week. Who's going to believe that? Contracted for who is going to believe that? Um, who's got the key? Who has got the key? I think you get, you get the picture. Um, your um, is an example of that that, that, is, um, that, that I see done um, wrongly quite a lot. Um, your Y-O-U-R um, is, is the possessive, so I was talking about your chair, um, your breakfast cereal, um, your bike, whatever, um, you would have the first spelling. Y-O-U apostrophe R-E is the contracted version of you are. Um, and in, in reading actively, if you see it with the apostrophe, um, trying to think about what it means, um, think about what does the apostrophe stand for, what is it? Um, what, what does it indicate is missing? Um, and that should help you decide which version to, to use. Um, I think in trying to remember, uh, trying to remember that the apostrophe is you are and the other you are is the possessive is, is the easiest way to do it. Although sometimes um, I think people remember that your Y-O-U-R is, is the possessive because I think of it as similar to her because it ends in an R as well and it has the same principles that your chair, her chair look quite similar. Um, you can try and remember it that way. Um, one that causes a bit of confusion is it's. So you see at the top, it is a mouse with an apostrophe. It's a mouse. Um, part of the reason for the confusion with it's, and sometimes people don't really know what to do with it, um, is because of the existence of the possessive pronoun it's. So you see in the in the bottom of the contractions bullet points there, the dog has cement all over its paws. So I've not put um, a, an apostrophe 
in that it's and that's because it's the possessive and it's not it's not indicating a missing word, uh, a missing letter there or any missing letters. Um, and I think a good way to remember that the possessive um, doesn't take an apostrophe is to think about other possessive pronouns. So, so for that, I mean words like your, my, his, her, their. Um, if I said um, his chair, his bike, her chair, her bike, um, none of those take an apostrophe. So by remembering that none of those take an apostrophe, you can hopefully translate that to the possessive it's and remember that, but it doesn't do it um, either. And I find that quite a good way to remember it. I think some, quite often with problematic grammar things, trying to think about um, something that you do know that's an equivalent is quite a good way of getting around it. So trying to think of a way that something similar is used, um, that you do know how it works, because chances are it might work um, in, in the same way. Um, where it's a plural, actually, I haven't mentioned plurals. Um, well, actually, I haven't mentioned possessives at all. The second main use of the apostrophe is um, to indicate where something is is possessive, uh, something is is um, possessed by somebody, which I think is part of the confusion with it um, and possessive pronouns as well. So, um, because to say my daughter's husband, you would be talking about the husband of my daughter, and that uses an apostrophe because it's possessive. The dog's bone is the bone of the dog, but the bone of the dog sounds a bit wordy and a bit complicated, so you use the apostrophe there to indicate the possessive. Um, in some examples, writing it out in full, so I think, for example, the door of the boathouse there, that, that sounds better as the door of the boathouse than the boathouse's door. The boathouse's door would also be correct, and you would have an apostrophe there to indicate possession, but it just sounds a bit weird. And sometimes reading out loud and that reading actively can help you decide what sounds a bit weird. And I think in general, the more you read different material, or particularly the kind of material that you want to be writing, it gives you an idea of what sounds a bit odd and, and what sounds better um, to use. The wife of my cousin may be one where you could use one or one or t'other. The wife of my cousin um, sounds OK. My cousin's wife also sounds OK. Um, but I think my daughter's husband sounds better than the husband of my daughter, for example. Um, so that, that possessive there is, is your second main use of the apostrophe, although not for the possessive pronoun. So um, for something like hers, um, his, theirs, yours, that, that doesn't use the apostrophe because that, isn't a, that would be used as part of a sentence. So you would say, um, you wouldn't say yours boathouse, you would say the boathouse is yours. So it's quite clear there that that's... Uh, is um, part of the sentence without having to, to use the apostrophe to, to, to indicate it. Um, so possessive pronouns, it's useful to remember, they never use um, apostrophe, apostrophes. Um, with a plural, with if you've got a plural um, noun, so it was, say, um, <laughs> my daughter's husband's, <laughs> for living in that kind of society, um, and it was plural, um, or if you were talking about, um, yeah, my daughter is plural, my daughter's plural and their husbands. Um, and in that, in that situation, you would put your apostrophe after the S of daughter to indicate that you are talking about the possessive of more than one person, um, if that makes sense. Um, so the, the apostrophe comes after the S in the case of a plural. And that, that happens as well sometimes if, um, a word ends in an S, or if it sounds, it, to, to add on an apostrophe and an S would make it sound a bit weird again. So say you were talking about Charles Dickens novels. With Charles Dickens novels, you would put an apostrophe after the, the S of Dickens, because saying Charles Dickens's novels is, is just a bit wordy and a bit funny on the tongue. It wouldn't be incorrect to have an apostrophe S. Um, it just looks better and sounds better um, not to have it when it, when it ends. Um, in the S. Um, if, if you're not sure about it, um, you can choose to write it out in full if it doesn't sound weird. So, for example, in the wife of my cousin, that sounds okay. If you weren't sure where the apostrophe should go, you could try and write that out um, in full. 
Um, actually, one common apostrophe error that, that I see quite a bit that's worth mentioning is with numbers. So with, say, um, a decade, the 1950s, the 1990s, people like to put apostrophes in, in um, decades. But um, for a plural noun like that, you wouldn't use an apostrophe. So it doesn't indicate missing. There's no missing letters there, and there's no possession being indicated there. So there's no need for an apostrophe in the 1950s. Um, similarly, for um, abbreviations, TVs, there would be no need for an apostrophe after that. Um, one that I see a lot is pizzas, actually, outside takeaways, not that I spend a huge amount of time wondering about outside takeaways, but um, you'll sometimes see a sign that says fish and chips with no apostrophe and chips and pizzas, and it has an apostrophe after the A for reasons I don't know. I think, I don't know if it's sometimes because it ends in a vowel, but I think it's important to remember because it's a plural, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have an apostrophe there unless you're indicating possession. Um, which which you you usually wouldn't be. Um, hyphens and dashes, um, <laughs> another exciting subject. Uh, again, this is often a, a stylistic choice about whether to, to use it. And the main thing when making stylistic choices is to be consistent all the way through a document. Another reason to have this kind of list of style preferences that you might have in documents. Um, where, that you have as part of your organisation. Um, sometimes more than one version can be correct, so it's useful to have an idea of which one you want to use. And you want to, um, you if you're going to hyphenate, say in the first example, if you're going to hyphenate weather beaten, you want to do it all the way through and, and not just in one or two um, examples. In the first example there, um, well, well, the point of a hyphen, first of all, um, is to, to prevent misunderstanding. So in the first example there, he had a weather beaten face. You, you don't need to use a hyphen. You could take the hyphen out, but it just wouldn't be completely clear that the weather, the words weather and beaten were linked to each other um, and being used to describe the face. In the second bullet point, his face was weather beaten. The use of the word was um, links both the words weather beaten back to the face. So, so you don't need a hyphen there um, because that's sort of implied in the, the way that the sentence is, is worded. But because it's positioned before the face um, in the first bullet point, the hyphen just helps make it clear that both, both of those words are associated with the face. But it wouldn't be a disaster not to use it there. Um, you would just want to make sure that you either did it all the way through a document or you didn't do it um, all the way through. Um, some words um, in being joined, to, some words are very commonly joined together to describe nouns quite commonly joined together as adjectives. And in, in that happening, they've kind of become words um, by themselves. Um, so, for example, handmade might have started, it sort of starts out as two words hyphenated, um, but actually handmade you would see as a word on its own quite a lot. Um, similarly with hard working, you could see that as a word on its own, um, although it, it could be hyphenated as well. But um, I, I, mentioned, I was talking earlier about changes to the English language, that's the kind of thing as well that, that I mean that words can, can form because they're used together so often. Um, they can form so that they become words um, in their own right and you get words kind of added to the dictionary in their own right um, all the time. Uh, hyphens can also sort of aid understanding in differentiating between, say, a noun and a verb. So if we look at the, the set of bullet points on this slide about the, the mark, about markup, in the first example, you have the markup of mathematics is complex. So the hyphen there is used to indicate that markup is a kind of compound noun. So it's a so the, it, again, it's used to indicate that those two words come together. Um, it wouldn't again, it wouldn't be essential. It's a style choice. It just makes things a bit clearer um, that those two words um, go together. In the second example, in saying, can you mark up this article by Friday, um, mark, to mark up um, is, is the verb. And um, because um, it's been used as a verb, it's quite clear that those words go together already without the use of a hyphen. So you wouldn't need um, to, to have a hyphen um, in there. Um, and 
again, it might look a, look a bit odd. And again, by reading things actively, you'd find in that kind of context, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't usually see one. Um, another place where you wouldn't you would very rarely use a hyphen is, um, I missed out the bullet point on the thickly spread jam, is after an adverb, so after that L-Y ending, because the use of the L-Y after thick to make thickly um, is making it quite clear that that is being used to describe how it's being spread. So the use of the L-Y link thickly to spread already without using a hyphen. So you wouldn't need to use a hyphen as well as that. That's the, the purpose of using um, the, the, the L-Y ending on the word. So you wouldn't need, you do see a hyphen there quite a lot because people use it where they don't need to, but that's somewhere where you don't, you don't need to have it. Um, dashes in the, the last lot of bullet points um, on this slide. These are different to hyphens and they're quite often sort of um, used interchangeably where they shouldn't necessarily be. A dash is just a bit longer than a hyphen um, and um, it might be simpler for everyone if they were the same, but unfortunately they're not. Um, quite often they're used in the same way as a comma to d denote sort of additional pieces of information in a sentence. So we have for four days, perhaps five, she saw no one, um, and a dash on either side of that. So you see that coming in pairs in the same way as you, as you would a comma. Um, and what you do need to do is just be consistent in using two of the same. So you would have, to have two, co you could have two commas there, you could have two dashes there, but you wouldn't have um, a dash and then a comma, like in the second bullet point, you would want to have a pair um, of the same to denote your, your um, your missing information or your additional um, information. Um, quotation marks, um, lots of decisions about quotation marks are stylistic. Um, for example, whether to have double or single quotation marks. It used to be it was quite strictly the case that US English used double quotation marks, UK English used single ones. Um, but uh, now it's really a style preference depending on um, the organisation that, that you're working for, the choice that, that you have, particularly as people work globally, um, so uh, aren't necessarily using UK English if they're in the UK, um, for example. Um, what I would say though is that you would have one kind inside another kind, so if you're using double quotation marks, then quotations inside that would use single ones. Similarly, if you're using single ones, then ones inside that would use um, double ones. Um, a good rule to remember about punctuation inside quotation marks is that the punctuation belongs to the sentence. Um, so if a sentence begins outside some quotation marks, um, then the full stop um, would come afterwards. Um, and if the the whole sentence is contained within quotation marks, um, or the same is true of brackets, actually, if the whole sentence is contained within it, then your punctuation, your full stop, or your question mark, or whatever, comes inside um, in, inside uh, the, the quotation marks. That's not, again, black and white, as you can see in these bullet points. Um, the first example on the second bullet point here, they can both be correct because as the old proverb goes, too many cooks spoil the broth. You can argue with that, too many cooks spoil the broth is a sentence in its own right, so you can have the full stop contained um, within that quotation mark. As the old proverb goes, too many cooks spoil the broth, you've got the, the full stop outside that. You can say, well, that's a complete sentence and too many cooks spoil the broth is not the entirety of it. Um, so you can also put the full stop outside it. Um, what you wouldn't do is have two, so you wouldn't have one inside and one outside. But as with a lot of these decisions, it's deciding which one, which approach you want to take and sticking with it um, for, for all the things that you're writing. Um, again, in, in US English, it's more common to include everything within your quotation marks, um, to include punctuation within your quotation marks than you would find in UK English. And you can use um, commas um, or colons to introduce this kind of quote. You could also use a colon to introduce these quotes. Um, although only a comma in the, the bullet point that says, so she said, you went to the party after all. So to join up those two parts of, of dialogue, you're using commas there. Um, 
and that's because the the colon um, wouldn't be used uh, twice. It doesn't extend um, a sentence out. It's really only intended to give explanations or, or examples. Um, next thing I want to look at is just some words that, that you could find that are commonly confused with each other. There are lots of these, so I will not go into too many. Um, just, just a couple um, to talk about. Effect and affect are ones that are confused a lot. So in the first example, you see the correct use of the study exam and the effect of, of a different approach. The affect, affect is a noun, um, but um, is, is, is quite different. Effect um, implies um, the, the, the influence of a, of a different approach or the results of a, of a different approach, whereas um, affect is, is about sort of performance and and language, quite a, quite a different word. Um, a different educational approach um, affects how the course can be delivered. So that means it influences how the course can be delivered. If you said it affects how the course can be delivered, um, that indicates that it, it actually carries out the. It actually carries out how the something to do with the course. So it's so it's quite a different meaning um, there between uh, between those two words. Um, some of these other mistakes are ones that are related to, to apostrophes. So there, there, and there are quite common ones. Um, they're taking their new car to the garage over there. Um, and I think some of the best ways to try and get this right is to, to be reading actively and looking at how these words are used in materials and thinking, well, why is that used there? So you have they are with the apostrophe. Um, indicating the missing letter there. So they're indicating they are taking their new car. So that's the possessive there to the garage over there, indicating location. Um, we're, where, and where, less commonly mixed up. But similarly, you have we're with an apostrophe is, is we are going to the city. Where my parents were born, where is indicating location, and where is your verb attached to your parents um, and, and and then being born. So quite different meanings in those words. Um, and try not to, I think, with using those words, try not to guess, try and work out um, which one it is that, that you do need to use um, in those examples. Um, one, one thing I think that, that people are often told to do, um, and, um, it, and it isn't always right to be told to do, it, is to say, um, my wife and I, for example, um, and we're always told not to say um, my sister and me. You say my sister and I. You don't always um, do that. The first example you have, my wife and me like to go to Spain for two weeks in May. Um, my wife and I, that would be correct because you're saying I like to go to Spain for two weeks in May. A good way to, to work it, I think, is to take out my wife and start out with just me. You wouldn't say me like to go to Spain. You say I like to go to Spain. So that should be I in the first of those examples. The careless driver sprayed my wife and I with mud. Um, in that case, you you wouldn't say the careless driver sprayed I with mud. You would say the careless driver sprayed my wife and me with mud because those are actually the, the object of the sentence is having something done to it. Um, so I think removing um, the, the first part of it and, and getting down to the I or the me and then reading the sentence without it is, is a good way to work out there which one, um, wh which version you should be using there. Um, just to finish off with, um, a couple of tips for proofreading. Um, as I said earlier, if, if, even if you think you, you, you know everything, even if you do know everything, things go wrong. Um, I, I know from reading my own PhD thesis, it's quite hard to proofread things that you've written yourself, especially things that you've invested a lot of time in and worked hard on, um, because you tend to see what you want to see instead of what's actually there. Um, and uh, it, it's um, so, so it's useful uh, to, to have an idea of some different strategies um, to go to. Um, you can see a few examples there of um, where things have, well, <laughs> the bottom right one is for fun, but the, the other ones where things have potentially made it through quite a lot of people looking at them before they, they've made it out into signage. Um, and uh, and out for, for public view with quite major errors um, on them. So just a few tips um, on that. Do always run a spell check, even if it's a really short document and you think, no, it's not worth it. 
Um, otherwise, we saw in the in the pubic transport example, um, words don't always come up in spell check, so don't just rely on the spell check. While I say always carry it out, don't um, don't rely on it um, only. Um, something I like to do with documents is try and take a few runs through it when you're doing a final check of something. The first time you do it, maybe check for spacing. The second time, check for um, headings and formatting of headings, how they're styled, and maybe the third time read through and focus entirely on language and grammar, um, rather than trying to read through it and look at headings and spacing and grammar and references and everything all together um, and diagrams. Um, try and look at those things separately um, and then your attention will be focused on them um, a bit more. Um, and if you can get someone else to, to have a look at it, a fresh pair of eyes is always good. I think somebody else tends to see things, see things that, that you don't. Um, and as sort of active reading, I think ways to get used to doing this as well as reading other material, read your own material and think, why have I used that word? Why have I used that particular piece of punctuation? What difference um, does it make? And then hopefully the, the knowledge and the, the awareness that you have um, doesn't, um, make it out into uh, the knowledge and the awareness that you have makes it out into the public eye without um, mistakes getting out that, that could have been rectified by um, proceeding with a slightly different strategy. Um, okay, I think I've spoken for slightly more than 40 minutes actually, so um, I hope I haven't bored you all to tears with, with grammar and punctuation. A bit of a whistle stop tour um, through it. Um, and um, I hope it's given you a wee bit of an idea and a few things um, to think about. Um, I will come out of sharing it just now. Um, okay, well, th thank you, thank you very much, uh, Alison. That, that was really interesting, and I've I've realised that I've got hashes and, uh, and hyphens the wrong way around for years. Um, so what I would say now is, uh, so thank you very much, that was very interesting. Um, so guys, if you've got any questions, if you go to the chat button at the bottom right, um, select the tab Q&A and, and type in any cost the questions, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through them uh, and Alison will ask them, answer them for you. So um, there's a couple of audience starting to appear, so please, please go for it. Um, first question is coming, is your opinion, Alison, on the Oxford comma? Ah, I think I think with the Oxford comma, which um, for for those who who don't know, is if you had say a list of a list of things, um, so you would have the if you had um, a list of more than three things for the Oxford comma. So if you had an an apple, a banana, and a pear, um, with, 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 if you had an Oxford comma in that, you would have a comma after the banana. So an apple, a banana, an apple comma, a banana comma, and a pear. Um, and uh, what, I, what I would say about it is it's purely a stylistic preference, um, and you'll find some style guides that use it and some style guides that don't, and I've edited for academic publishers that, that use it um, and academic publishers that don't. And uh, the, 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 point, the point of it is really to, to indicate that you're in a list, so you would never use it in just two things. So if you said apples and bananas, that would never have an Oxford comma, but if you had a list of, of more than that, and um, it's um, really intended to sort of add clarity in it. I don't, I, you find lots of people who sort of very, are very attached to them, and you find people who um, don't like using them at all. I would sit myself somewhere in the middle, and I don't really mind, I think, because I've edited material that, that, that um, uses uses it and material that doesn't use it. So um, I would say if you're going to use it, just use it consistently. If you're not going to use it, don't use it consistently. Um, but for me, it, does, it doesn't really matter too much. Okay. Um, and our, our next question is, um, someone's struggling with the difference between a colon and a semicolon. Okay, so um, so the, the colon um, is it's just really that it's stronger than a semicolon, and um, <laughs> if you want to think about that that visually, I think it's just got the, the the two the two dots. I think of that as as stronger, and I like to think about the comma at the bottom of the semicolon as indicating it's a bit more wishy washy. So the level um, actually the colon semicolon slide is still up there for some reason. So um, I will uh, I'll use it seeing as it's here. Um, but in Sue's coming to the party, colon. And he's going fishing. There's a very direct relationship there, and you would find that in, say, say a subtitle, "Lord of the Rings: Colon, The Return of the King." That's 
very direct link that's a subtitle of, of a title. Those, those are, are sort of linked together. Um, the semicolon might be used, um, for example, if, if you weren't using a, a joining word in a sentence. So you've got Alice is coming to the party, semicolon, Mike's going fishing there. You could say Alice is coming to the party and Mike's going fishing. So imply those two people know each other. There's a bit of a connection there, but they're not really directly linked um, to each other. Um, a full stop would imply no connection at all between those. What I would say about the semicolon is um, if you're not sure about it, don't use it because um, it, it, it can be used in quite particular places um, and you can use it to join up two sentences where you don't use a conjunction like and or but um, to join a sentence um, just to imply a bit of connection between them, but it wouldn't be as direct a connection as within a colon, if that helps. Um, okay, and, and, then, and the next one, um, this is quite a nice one. The, is there a rule of using um, the number up until, the actual physical number up until 10 and then using, sorry, I've got another wrong around. Uh, is there still a rule that numbers below 10 should be written in text and 11 upwards, or 10 upwards, I guess, are written as numbers? Um, again, that would be a style choice. Um, so um, you, you would certainly have, if, uh, an or most organisations or reports or documents would have a consistent rule about this, but it might be different from one document to another. So quite often in scientific documents, um, it would be the case that numbers under 100 would be in numerals um, and uh, numbers over that um, would be written. So, so, so 2,000 might be written out as, as words um, or there might be a rule about 1,000. Um, in humanities work, so um, a lot of the work that I do in, in history um, and um, so social sciences as well, so things like management, um, quite often it would be you would write you would have numbers um, sort of up to sorry up to up to ten in in words um, uh, up to a hundred. Uh, in words, sorry, I'm going to start that again because in, in, in humanities you would quite often have, I think I said numbers up to 100 in numerals for sciences, but in humanities you would quite often have, say, numbers up to about 100 in, in words and beyond that you would have them in, in numerals, so, so, so bigger ones than that um, written in numerals, whereas in sciences it would be more common to have that just up to 10. Um, so you would have, say, um, you would use words for um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then you would use numerals for ten onwards. Um, and um, usually because you're using numbers um, an, an awful lot more in that case. So um, in a document that you're working with, you would have that rule kind of set down in a style guide, or if there's not an official style guide, it would be one that you are working to, working to yourself, trying to keep a, a note of it and saying, am I using words for numbers 1 to 10? Am I using words for numbers 1 to 100? Um, e even where you've got a rule like that, even where you've got a rule in place that says, right, I'm using words numbers um, 1 to 10, um, you might find that other words, if you were talking about 7 million, for example, you might not write that out in numerals, you might still write that out as 7 and then million, the word, um, so you would probably have a style rule um, about that as well. So the answer is, uh, yes, there would be a rule about it, but it's not always the same, it's not always the same number. Okay. Um, the next question, um, can you explain when you use an apostrophe for an object like cars? So you you, you wouldn't, um, as it stands like with cars, you would have, so if I said I like cars, that is that is just saying there's more than one car. So there's no missing letters there and there's no possessive there. So there's no apostrophe there. So plurals, plurals, when I, so if you're saying that there's more than one of something, Almost never, almost never use an apostrophe. Um, the only time if you had cars as a word and you were going to use an apostrophe, if I was saying the cars engines, for example, if I was talking about more than one car, plural cars, and I was talking about their engines, then I might, I would say the cars with an apostrophe engines. So I'm talking about something belonging to the car to indicate um, indicate possession. If I was saying um, the car, is, the car is going down the motorway, I could have an apostrophe there. So I could have the car apostrophe S going down the motorway, and that's shortened from the car is going down the motorway. 
Um, so you would use an apostrophe there, but that's just one car. That's a singular car. So for just talking about a plural um, on its own, you wouldn't use um, an apostrophe there. Okay, and I think the, the the question got cut off because in in the next question he's put apostrophe same guy a person sorry apostrophe s bumper so I think it's you've answered it anyway but cars bumper I think what it, it the oh. question was oh okay yeah so so you could use that so you would use that to you could say the car's bumper um to mean the bumper of the car the bumper that belongs yeah. that belongs to the car yeah okay um and then the last question we've got so far is um three options oh another question coming uh, life cycle or um, two words, life cycle, one word, or life hyphen cycle, which one would be correct? A a any of the above, so long as you use the same one all the way through. That's what I was talking about, style choices. Um, all of those I have seen used in, in different places. Life cycle, I, I think it probably started out with two words, life cycle, um, but because it's been used together so often, it's actually become understood it's in the dictionary as a word on its own. Wouldn't be incorrect to use it as two words. Also fine to use it hyphenated. The main thing with it is to be consistent with it. So if you're referring to a life cycle all the way through a document, you would have um, the same version all the way through is the main thing that's important, but all would be correct. Okay, uh, next question is, um, I'll read this one. I end li um, list elements with a semicolon. Um, if a list element also introduces a sub list, should I change this to a colon? So you could have a semi, you could have semicolons as you go through a list. Um, so if a, a colon can be used to introduce a list at the start. So um, say I, I have four different cars. Um, full stop. The brands are as follows: colon. That would introduce my list, and then I might list my different brands of car. Um, what you can actually, this is more commonly done if you have a list with slightly longer sentences in it. Um, you could have a semicolon at the end of, of each element of that list um, to indicate um, that, that you're moving on to the next bullet point. They're not really necessary to have it because if, you, if you've got a bullet list, um, the fact that they're in bullets indicates that they're separate. So you don't really need a semicolon there, but you, you can have it to, just to indicate that division a bit further. For the last one in the list, you would have a full stop and not a semicolon just to indicate it's at the end um, of the sentence. Although bullet lists, um, it is quite common to see the ends of those kind of not punctuated at all, particularly if they're really short um, bullets. You see the ones I've got there actually up on that colon slide have got full stop because they're full sentences. Um, so if you had um, bullet points that were full sentences or kind of longer phrases, you might have a full stop um, or if the longer phrases is probably where a semicolon is most useful because it, it, it divides up those from the other ones. But usually just bullets on its own is, is sufficient and you would have your colon to, to, to introduce the list um, and, a, and a full stop at the end of it. Okay, and then just to finish the end of that same question, if you had a sub, so you had three bullet points, and after the second bullet point, uh, you had a subset of bullet points, would you put a colon after the, the, the first bullet point to show there's a list after it? Okay, so if you had a sub, uh, a sub, yes. a sub list kind of within a list, yeah, so you could use a colon to introduce, if you were introducing your sub list, you could then use a colon um, at that point, yes, absolutely. Um, so, so your semicolon would be your dividers within a list, your colon is your introduction to a list, but yeah, that can be a sub list as well. Um, brilliant, I think that's answered that. Um, um, could Alison explain what a clause is and what a phrase is? Mm -hmm. Not sure. Yeah, so so both are both are parts of a sentence. I think the the, the difference um, the difference would be um, really that a, a clause can make sense on its own, um, but a phrase um, can't. So actually, I'll bring up my slides again. Count the first one that gives us a little help because I've got the. Actually, I'll, I'll talk about the in front of me just now is the, the colons and semicolons slide. Which is, and if you look at the middle one, Alice is coming to the party. Mike's going fishing. Because that's written as a, as a with a semicolon as one sentence, then both of those elements of the sentence are clauses because they make sense um, on their own. So Alice is coming to the party. It can be a sentence in its own right. But in that context, it's a sort of clause. It's kind of part of the the sentence. Um, I'm going to share my first slide just for a second. Um, so, is it? so let's go back. 
go back to the beginning. Here we go. So if we go to the example of my cousin Sarah, who lives next door, um, always eats the white chocolate first. Um, <clears throat> you would have here kind of um, always eats the white chocolate first has got a a verb um, in it as well. So that that can be a that can be a clause that links back to my cousin Sarah. So you can have that as sort of part of the sentence. Who lives next door? Which is your additional information in that sentence, surrounded by by the commas that. Can't, within that context, that can't stand alone by itself. So we would call that um, a phrase because it can't say it can't say anything um, on its own. Um, whereas a clause can make sense um, on its own. So a clause will usually actually that particular phrase, "Who lives next door," does have a, a verb in it. But a clause will usually have a, a verb in it, or will connect to the first part of the connect to the first part of the, the sentence as well. And there's lots of different different kinds of them um as well. Um but but there's a basic way to distinguish them is that if that phrase can't stand alone, or if a, a clause can't if that follows. I'll come out of this sharing again. Okay. Um so this is a very good question here. Um I'll read it out. I don't think my company has a stylist guide. Um, do you know of any generic guides um, I could show my company so we could create our own. Oh, now, um, That's a great pro idea. probably the, the Chartered Institute for Editing and Proofreading probably has one. Um, I, us I usually just start from scratch with things, um, and uh, I can certainly um, email um, somebody an example of, of how I would do it as, as an example. Um, but the, the organization that I trained with, the Chartered Institute for Editing and Proofreading, um, will probably have one um, if yeah, yeah and I imagine lots of organizations um, do as well so if you knew a similar organization that produced a lot of documents it might be worth asking but I mean I can, I'm certainly happy to email an example of of a template I usually have a bit of a template to ones that I use because I will usually start from scratch with if I edit a document then I'll just start one at the beginning and add to it all the way through unless I'm working with somebody that's got one already. Um, so I, I'm happy to do that. But try, I'll pop it in the chat, actually. I'll try and do it to, to everybody. Um, can I do that yet? So, so, so what we can do is we can, um, as the person who asked the question um, emails the organizer. So on the event page, you'll find uh, contact organizer and send me an email. And what I'll do is I'll put you in contact and we'll get you a copy of that. Um, I've just put it. Um, <laughs> The name, I think it might be the Chartered Institute of Editing and Proofreading, actually, now that I've written that, but you'll find it if you pop it into Google. Um, and they've got lots of tips on things to do with editing and proofreading there. Um, and they may well have an example of a style guide, though I couldn't swear to it. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so someone's asked, um, full stop at the end of bullet points. So um, I, I would say... Yes, if it's full sentences. Um, so, um, as in the, the colon slide that, that, that's still up there, um, you can, I've put full stops there because I've used full sentences there. Quite often, bullet points don't have full sentences. So, if I had this is a list of colours: colon, blue, red, yellow. You wouldn't need full stops after all of those um, because they're, they're, they're just words on their own. They're not full sentences. Um, you might have one right at the end of the list. Um, you, you don't have to, but that would kind of denote you know, the end of the sentence, I suppose. So if you said, this is a list of colours, colon, then you had your list of colours, um, then your full stop at the end of the bullet list would just indicate that your sentence was finished. But that's stylistic. You wouldn't necessarily need to have to have those because most people understand that the, the end of a bullet list is the end of a bullet list, but it would be fine to have one at the end. But if it's just short bullets, you wouldn't need a full stop after each after each list entry. Right. Okay. Um, and then uh, another question. Um, this is what I struggle with. Um, what uh, should there be a space between a number and its units, i.e., one kilowatt or one space kilowatt? Because um, if you use amps, for, use an A for amps, for example, Word um, doesn't like it because it thinks A is a letter on its own. If that makes sense. So should there be a space or no space? Um, I, again, that's another stylistic one. Um, so again, um, usually I see it with no with no space. It tends to be sort of a bit neater, but I've seen it with spaces as well. And um, I, I, again, it's, um, it's the same standard answer, just being consistent all the way through. Um, so 
I would say I more commonly see it with no space than than with a space, um, but it wouldn't be incorrect to have it with a space so long as it's it's done in the same way all the way through. Okay. Um, is there any other questions, uh, guys? Oh, oh yeah. Is that is that um, someone's posted a link? Um, ah, the style guide just gone up um, on 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 the. Chat room. If they want to have a look at that. Um, if there's any other questions, guys, um, um, before we close this down, okay. So it sounds like that's the end of it. So uh, someone's very kindly sent a link um, there, which seems to have come from your your um, Chartered Institute of uh, Editing um, and Proofreading. Um, thank you very much, Alison. That was very interesting. Um, a recording of this um, will be made available on the uh, iMeki YouTube channel. Um, so you can go back and you can have another look at the slides or, or listen um, to Alison uh, in the future. Um, so thank you very much, guys. Thank you for attending and thank you very much, Alison. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, grammar, okay. grammar you all out. <laughs> <laughs> That was great. Well, I'll give you a ring after this, Alison. Okay. Okay, Phil. Thank you. Thanks. Okay.